1 Samuel 13. This is kind of a, a peculiar passage that I've had some questions about before. And uh, so let's take a look at it and hear what God's Word has to say to us. Saul lived for one year and then became king. And when he had reigned for two years over Israel, Saul chose 3,000 men of Israel. 2,000 were with Saul in Michmash and in the hill country of Bethel. And 1,000 were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin. And the rest of the people he sent home, every man to his tent. Jonathan defeated the garrison of the Philistines that was at Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. And Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. And all Israel heard it and said that Saul had defeated the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel had become a stench to the Philistines. And the people were called out to join Saul at Gilgal. And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. They came up and camped at Michmash to the east of beth And when the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. Saul was still at Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. He waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. But Samuel did not come to Gilgal. And the people were scattering from him. So Saul said, Bring the burnt offering here to me, and the peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. As soon as he had finished offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him and greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? And Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. And Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. For then the Lord would have established your kingdom over Israel forever, but now your kingdom should not continue. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart, and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people, because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. And Samuel arose and went up from Gilgal. The rest of the people went up after Saul to meet the army. They went up from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. All right. It might seem here that Saul was set up for failure. It might seem like that's the case here. First of all, Samuel was late. This is something that Deirdre brought up the last time we read this passage together. Deirdre is somebody who's very punctual, as many of you maybe know, and so when Samuel was late, well, of course, then Saul would have to, have to offer that offering because Samuel should not have been late, right? So there was that, but also Saul was against a massive, uncountable army. There were as many Philistines as there were sand on the seashore. Uh, the army that he was leading was scattered and hiding. They were hiding in all different kinds of places there. And the Philistines were about to attack, So, he wanted to offer up the sacrifice before going to battle, and if the Philistines were about to attack and Samuel was late, I mean, what is he expected to do, right? Well, so I determined, I wanted to figure out what was going on here. So, I translated the passage, I consulted every commentary that I had, I wanted to figure out what was really going on here. And what I discovered is that there's a lot that, this passage doesn't tell us. There's a lot of details that are missing. There's some unanswered questions here. So, for example, in verse 13, it says, the command of the Lord your God. What exactly was that command? We're not told in this passage, 
And there's different ideas about what that command might even be. So it's not entirely clear what that is. Verse 8, the Hebrew especially, is a little open-ended. Um, he waited seven days, the time appointed by Samuel. It's not very clear. That's just our best guess of what that means. We don't really know. And when Samuel arrives, he seems to know right away that Saul's kingdom is not going to endure. He didn't receive a word from the Lord that, that we know of, or, or when did he? I mean, how did he know that? He seems to know right away. So what's going on there? And it's a little strange that he appears just after Saul makes this sacrifice. What's, what's that about? Well, let's say, let's just kind of give you a, an idea about what is going on here a little bit. Especially if you kind of feel a little bad for Saul in this passage. Okay, let's say, let's say it's your wedding day. It's your wedding day. And um, let's say, let's say you're, let's say just for the sake of example here, let's say you're the groom. And you're standing up here, and you're waiting for the bride. And you're waiting, and everybody's gathered, and you're waiting and waiting, and the bride's not here. You know, she was supposed to get ready and, and show up, and she's not here. What's going on? And everybody who's, all your friends and your neighbors and your family, everybody's starting to stir and look around and... And people are starting to whisper amongst themselves, and you're like, um, what's going on here? And then finally, it's been long enough, and people start to get up and leave. I guess there's not going to be a wedding here today. So, in that position, would you at that point decide, well, the people came to see a wedding, so... The, get, the bride's not here. I guess I'm just going to propose and marry the, the maid of honor and see if she'll marry me. She's single. Maybe I'll ask her and maybe she'll marry me today. I mean, the people came to see a wedding. They might as well have a wedding. And I need to marry somebody. It might as well be her. I mean, can you imagine doing that? That's a little bit what's going on here. If you think Saul is maybe set up for failure, maybe gets the short end of the stick, I mean, there's some unanswered questions here that we don't really know. But one thing that is clear is that Saul has a lack of faith. Saul's lack of faith here is very clear. In spite of any lingering questions about the circumstances of what's going on here, Saul's lack of faith is crystal Look at verses 11 and 12 again, if you still have your Bibles open. Saul said, When I saw that the people were scattering from me, and that you did not come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines had mustered at Michmash, I said, Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal, and I have not sought the favor of the Lord. So I forced myself and offered the burnt offering. Okay, first of all, Saul was worried because the people were scattering. Okay, he's leading an army of people. It's more like a militia, actually. They didn't have too much of a standing army at this time. And they were starting to scatter because they were vastly outnumbered, as might make sense. But if you're Saul and you're the king, and if you know anything about Israelite history, then you would know that God doesn't need numbers to win a victory. His trust was in numbers and the image among the people. As you read through the Bible, you will see that Saul often cares about what other people think and he, way too much. He would care way too much about what others think, particularly when David starts to come onto the scene. They started to say about him and David, Saul has slain his thousands, David is ten thousands. He starts to get really upset about that. They have ascribed to David tens thousands and to me only thousands. What more can he have but the kingdom now? Everybody likes him better. 
In chapter 14, the very next chapter here, if uh, you read uh, your Bible reading tracks this week, Chapter 14 will show that God does not need high numbers even in this battle at all. Just in short, what was going to happen is that Saul's son, Jonathan, with his armor bearer, just the two of them are going to go up to the Philistine camp and trusting God, seeing if God is going to give them some sort of clue, and they're going to attack and the whole army is going to scatter, just the two of them. God doesn't need high numbers, and Saul doesn't need the favorable opinion of the people. But he thinks he does, because his trust is in the wrong place. Saul acts on fear, not faith. He could have trusted that God was going to be there, that he was going to come through, but he didn't. He's full of fear, and he acts on that fear. When David goes up to fight Goliath, you know, just nobody, if you, if you were placing bets on that match, nobody would have put any money on David. But what David does there, right, he says to Goliath, all those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give all of you into our hands. So that's the faith that Saul could have, should have had at that point. Saul was wanting the ritual sacrifice and the timing of, of an attack here. When you're fighting, timing is everything. And so he's worried that he's going to lose strategic timing against the enemy. So he says, I forced myself. I forced myself. Saul is trusting himself. He's not trusting God. He's acting on his own. He's acting independently. He was even going against his own better judgment in this situation. In a couple chapters prior to this, it says the Spirit of God comes upon Saul, and Saul actually led an army to defeat the Ammonites. And it was this great victory. Everybody was happy with Saul and and the Spirit of God came upon him and he was moved to to fight the Ammonites, to defend the town that they were besieging. And it was this great victory. Why couldn't Saul have acted that way then? Why couldn't he wait for the Spirit of the Lord then? If the Spirit wasn't moving him, why did he have to force himself to move? And then he says, I have not sought the favor of the Lord. Saul thinks that God is someone to be bought here. Kind of like God's a gumball machine. Like if you do the sacrifice, then you have God's favor and he'll give you victory. As if that's how God works. Saul doesn't see God as a personal God or a loving God. He sees him as a gumball machine God. Saul doesn't inquire of the Lord. He doesn't pray. He doesn't ask God, God, what should I do? If you look back in times past, there were many times when the people or the king or the leader or whoever have asked, God, what shall we do? And God gives an answer. Why doesn't Saul do that? He thinks God is shallow and just wants sacrifices. Like, if you do do for me, then I'll do for you. There's a human tendency to think that God is like us. That God thinks like us, acts like us, has the same expectations. And so we think God is vindictive or controlling or whatever. And Saul falls into that. He treats sacrifices as some superstitious right to leverage God's favor instead of trusting and obeying. God wants wants to be obeyed and heard and trusted. If we obey God, that means we trust Him. 
And if we trust him, that means we believe in him. God wants to be believed. From a human point of view, there are many reasons to sin. Paul, or Saul, rather, lists them all here. But if you believe and you adopt God's point of view, then sinning is just rebellion. From a human point of view, there's a lot of reasons to sin. There's a lot of reasons to just go yourself, to trust yourself. But if you believe, if you adopt God's point of view, then sin just becomes rebellion. That's all it is. There's a lot of excuses that we can make for sins that we would commit and do commit. Just uh, this this week, I was looking through Facebook, and um, Ducky posted something. And uh, she was quoting somebody else who had talked about suicide and how suicide is death caused by the illness of depression. It is the final symptom A final collapse under unbearable weight, as in people who commit suicide because of depression, that they're just victims of that, as if they didn't have a choice in the matter at all. If If you're clinically depressed and you have some inclinations to self harm, From a human point of view, you might have a lot of reasons to self-harm. You might have a lot of reasons because maybe you're, you're hopeless. Maybe you're just unexplicably sad. And maybe you can't see a future for yourself. Maybe you feel like nobody cares about you anymore. Whatever. You might have a lot of reasons. From your point of view. But if you believe in God and you adopt his point of view, then self-harm is simply rebellion. It's a rejection of God. That's just one example. From a human point of view, we can come up with all kinds of reasons to justify sin. But from God's point of view, it's just rebellion. The bottom line in this passage here is that Saul doesn't have a heart that's after God's. And Samuel tells him that. You you don't have a heart that's after God. God's going to find somebody else who's going to serve in this capacity, who is going to have a heart after his, and he is going to take your spot. But where Saul failed, Christ succeeded. Christ succeeded. Saul was a king who did not live up to what he was expected, but Christ did. Where everybody abandoned Jesus, Jesus did not waver. On that night of Gethsemane, everybody scattered from him, and he didn't cave. He was ridiculed by everyone. All of the leaders and the chief priests, even Herod, just they ridiculed him, they mocked him. And he stayed strong. When he was distressed praying that night, he didn't act rashly. He didn't try to bargain with God out of this. When the cup couldn't be passed unless he drank it, he didn't try to see if God he could leverage God out. He didn't try to force God's hand. He trusted God every moment of his life. This is a pattern of when you read the Old Testament, you see people failing. You see people having good faith, but even the people who have the best faith, they have moments where they fail. And the Old Testament is meant to show us that all of us fall short, but Christ does not. Where we fail, he succeeds. Let's look at the screen here, and let's answer this question together. Why is he called Christ, meaning anointed? Because he has been ordained by God the Father and has been anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who perfectly reveals to us the secret counsel and will of God 
for our deliverance. Our only high priest who has set us free by the one sacrifice of his body and who continually pleads our cause with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit and who guards us and keeps us in the freedom he has won for us. So in the Old Testament, there were prophets and priests and kings, and all of them fell short somewhere. But Christ does not. And so we look to him. While we would fail like Saul, Jesus is our victory. I think when we're reading Saul, we're supposed to kind of identify with him a little bit, where, boy, if I was facing that army and everybody around me was scattering, I would probably waver too. I, I think that my knees would be shaking, and I think that I might, I might panic. And I might forget God's point of view. I might forget about all the ways that He has helped our nation in the past, and I might just rashly make that sacrifice too. Because our faith is weak. Jesus would say many times to his own disciples, you, you just have so little faith. Not even the size of a mustard seed. We cave to pressure and we act rashly when we're under pressure. That's the nature of who we are. But Christ, look at Colossians 1 here. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. And a little later on, you who are once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death. So where we fail, Christ has won the victory for us. And that is good news. So Jesus has saved us, but he also shows us how it's done. Faith is tested and shown when the pressure is on. When Jesus was ridiculed and when he suffered, that was his finest hour. That was his finest hour. Saul was under pressure and he acted on fear. He was greatly outnumbered, his men were scattering, and time was wasting. But Jesus, he had faith. And he persevered. When the pressure is on, obedience equals trust. We're all going to be in times when the pressure is on. When it's going to make more sense to sin, at least to our minds. And it's in those moments when we need to trust God. And not just do what's easiest. So it's easy to be kind when others are kind. But what happens when others are not kind? It's easy to forgive when others forgive. But what if nobody else is forgiving each other? It's easy to obey when you live in a place and a time when everybody's doing what they're supposed to do. But imagine living in a society where People are committing murder all the time. All the time. People are dying around you all the time. And now you are in the crosshairs. Imagine that. You're in the crosshairs now. Wouldn't it be really easy for you to just take out that person who's got you down? When everybody's killing each other, murdering Makes more sense, doesn't it? If your spouse is cheating on you, it'd be tempting to cheat in kind. Or when other people are lying and living lies, it's easy to lie. When other people are gossiping and sharing all this juicy information, it's easy to throw out some of your own too. Sometimes it's easy to obey. The real question is, what happens when the pressure's on? It's in those moments when our faith is shown for what it really is. Do we really trust God or do we trust ourselves? So let's walk 
live and act in the salvation that has been won for us. Look at the screen here again. Why are you called a Christian? Because by faith I am a member of Christ, and so I share in His anointing. I am anointed to confess His name, to present myself to Him as a living sacrifice of thanks, to strive with a good conscience against sin and the devil in this life, and afterward to reign with Christ over all creation for all eternity. Let's walk in the salvation that has been won for us. So like Jesus, you and I, we share in his anointing. So one of the, part of that anointing is that we are kings. Like Jesus, kings obey even when faced with death. Even when the pressure is that strong. Even when a gun is put to our heads. We obey even then. Psalm 119, teach me, O Lord, the way of your statutes, and I will keep it to the end. I will keep your word to the end. And a little later in that same psalm, I hold my life in my hand continually, but I do not forget your law. The wicked have laid a snare for me, but I do not stray from your precepts. Your testimonies are my heritage forever. What it means to be a king is that we obey and we follow Jesus even when the pressure is the greatest. Like Jesus, kings persevere even when others desert. Like Jesus, kings believe even when they don't see. Kings adopt God's point of view over their own. And like Jesus, kings trust even when they're afraid. I'm going to close with Psalm 27, verse 1. This is your Bible reading track for today. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Who? Let's go and be kings this week. And let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God in heaven, we thank you for the grace that you've shown us in Jesus Christ and the victory that we have in him. Lord, we are grateful that we share in that anointing to be kings. Lord, help us to be kings like Jesus Christ. Lord, where we maintain and persevere even when the pressure is on, that we trust and obey and trust in Jesus who showed us the way. And we pray in his name. Amen.